There is coming a day when no heartache shall come. No more clouds in the sky, no more tears to dim the eye. All is peace forevermore on that happy golden shore. What a day, glorious day that will be. What a day that will be. When my Jesus I shall see, and I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace, when he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land, what a day, glorious day, that will be. There'll be no sorrows there, no more burdens to bear, no more sickness, no pain, no more parting over there. And forever I will be with the one who died for me. What a day, glorious day, that will be. What a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see. And I look upon his face. The one who saved me by his grace When he takes me by the hand And leads me through the promised land What a day, glorious day that will be Are you looking forward to that day? I am 322 Stand up, stand up for Jesus, ye soldiers of the cross. Lift high his royal banner, it must not suffer loss. From victory unto victory, his army shall he lead. Till every foe is vanquished and Christ is Lord indeed. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, the trumpet call obey. For to the mighty conflict.
conflict in this glorious day. Ye that are men now serve him against a numbered foe. Let courage rise with danger and strength, strength the foes. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, stand in his strength alone. The arm of flesh will fail you, ye dare not trust your own. Put on the gospel armor and watching unto prayer, where duty calls or day. Be never wanting there. Amen. I'm out of breath. All right, you may be seated. We're going to take the offering at this time. Brother Clay, could you stand and ask the Lord to bless the offering? I know you were almost down. Not the Rocky this coming Sunday, at least he won't admit it, but him and his wife are visiting, so make sure you greet them. Um, missions Conference coming up this weekend. Um, also, I'll be out of town next weekend hunting in Colorado, so pray that an elk that's blind would walk in front of my tent just right through there on the first day, and I can come home early. <coughs> it probably is not going to happen. I got Brother Decker on my side. He's praying. All right, let's stand. Heavenly sunlight, heavenly sunshine. Oh, wait a minute. This is heavenly sunshine. It's kind of the same thing. It changed the words on me. It's the K K I V K I V version. <clears throat> Five fifty. Heavenly sunshine, heavenly sunshine. Bloody my soul with glory divine. Heavenly sunshine, heavenly sunshine. Hallelujah, Jesus is mine. All right, I think I got it now. So it's just worded just a little differently. So, all right, let's sing it through again. Heavenly sunshine, heavenly sunshine. Bloody my soul with glory divine.
heavenly sunshine, heavenly sunshine, hallelujah, Jesus is mine, amen. We found out last Wednesday night, you can be seated, that uh, the sunshine in heaven is going to be Jesus. All right, Pastor. All right, thank you for coming to church tonight. Take your Bible, if you would, please, and turn to the book of 1 Timothy, chapter 4, tonight. 1 Timothy, chapter 4. 1 Timothy, chapter 4. Here for the shenanigans. <laughs> what is it? So I got to look out and teach and preach when I see a shirt like that. What's that all about? Are <laughs> oh, you going to making it hard on me? Come on. All right. 1 Timothy, chapter 4, and verse 12. I'm going to talk to you tonight and bring a message tonight. It probably will expel over to other Wednesday nights, but the importance of example, the importance of being the right example in our life. And this was written to young Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 4, and verse 12. And Timothy was pastoring a church, and Timothy was a little nervous because he was pastoring a church of older people. And he was a little intimidated by that. And so 1 Timothy chapter 4, and verse 12, as usual, we'll read in just a minute. Many times it's used when you talk about youth ministry or youth groups, things like that. But it doesn't just really refer to that. Really, the basis behind that, it was written to, uh, by Paul to young Timothy to encourage him because he thought him being young that older Christians wouldn't listen to him. And Paul said that's not true. And so this verse, it, it can be used in youth ministry and those type of things, but it primarily is an encouragement by the Apostle Paul to young Timothy to not think of himself lower than he needed to be. And so it says, Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example. Be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. Our lives, whether we like it or not, are making an imprint, and, and, and they're making a mark on others for the good or for the bad. The word example simply means this. It means someone or something that serves as a pattern to be imitated. As a pattern to be imitated. Take your Bible and go to the book of Titus. Another book over there, Titus chapter 2 and verse number 7. And uh, this epistle or the letter of Paul to young Titus. And we're saying here in verse number 7, In all things, showing thyself a pattern... Of good works in doctrine, showing uncorruptness, gravity, and sincerity. And so, what Paul was saying to Titus is that you need to be a good example. Now, how many would agree with me tonight that Christians ought to be good examples? And they ought to be good examples in the workplace, ought to be good examples in our home, in the community, and so on. And so, it's very important that we have the right type of example. As parents, if you're a parent, we stamp our values and character into the lives of the children by the way that we live. You've seen the, the illustration before the commercial, like father, like son. And the father's doing something years ago. It was a uh, commercial on something. He was doing something that he really didn't need to be doing. And the next thing you know, the son's doing what the dad did. And it, it kind of it's a message there that you're an example. And so what a great principle that is. So tonight, let's look into the scriptures and see those things that are examples. There are many, many things in the Bible that are examples. So first of all tonight, the scriptures are our example. Amen? The scriptures are our example. Take your Bible go to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians in chapter 10 tonight in verse number 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 1. We're going to read down 11 verses here. The Bible says, Moreover, brethren... Now he says, brethren, he's talking to Christians... And, of course, this was written to the church that was at Corinth. And the church at Corinth was the most carnal of all the New Testament churches. And yet they had the most gifted speakers and preachers of all the New Testament churches. And so they had gotten saved out of Corinth. And Corinth was a very wicked city. And when they got saved, they brought some of those things into the church. And the Apostle Paul dealt with a lot of those issues in 1 Corinthians. And so 1 Corinthians is a great book. Then you have 2 Corinthians. But in 1 Corinthians chapter... Uh, 10, the Bible says, Moreover, brethren, Paul speaking, I would not that you should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. Now, it's going back in history, and it's talking about the crossing of the Red Sea. So he's going back in history. History is very important. 
Now, I know in our country, we're kind of having some difficulty about that, trying to redefine history. But history is what it is, good or bad. And so Paul's going back, and he's reminding them of the past history of the children of Israel as they left the nation of Egypt, and they moved towards the Promised Land. And one of the first obstacles was the Red Sea. And they thought that the Pharaoh's army was coming after them. They saw the clouds of smoke and the chariots and everything. And they thought their backs were against the wall, and God performed a great miracle with Moses. And the Red Sea parted, and the Bible says they walked about on dry ground. That's significant. It wasn't muddy, it didn't bog down, dry ground. And in Pharaoh and his army, they followed him, and then the walls collapsed, and all of Pharaoh's army were drowned. And uh, God told Moses that you don't have to worry about the Egyptians anymore or Pharaoh anymore. You're not seeing them anymore. And all of them died, and their bodies floated maybe to the surface or maybe to the banks or whatever. But the scriptures are an example for us. And so Paul's taking them back to the nation of Israel. Verse 2, and, and we're all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And did all eat the same spiritual meat, and did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. I love the song, On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. What a great truth that is. Verse number 5, But with many of them... God was not well pleased. I preached a message, that's probably been many years ago. What pleases God? What pleases God? And so the Bible is talking about the history here, and that many of them, God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things were our examples to the intent we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Neither be ye idolaters, as were some of them. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication, as some of them committed, and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. Neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. Remember the story, they were bitten by the serpents and had to raise up the post, and the way that they would uh, be saved from that was to look and live. The American Medical Society's emblem we really realize that America is influenced by the Bible in many, many ways. And the American metal, it has the staff and has the serpent wrapped around the staff. And that's from back here uh, in the nation of Israel and so on. So history is very important. And we need to learn from it and not do the things that they did that got them into trouble. Now, verse number 10, Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured, and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now, verse 11, Now, all these things, those 10 previous verses, happened unto them for in samples that they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. So the scripture is our example. In first, I think it's in first Peter chapter, uh, second Peter chapter one and verse three, I think it says that God has given us all things that pertain to life. In this Bible, we have everything that impacts every area of our life. You believe that tonight? The Bible is the Word of God and it's an example, but it has all things that pertain to life and godliness. So when I became a Christian, the Bible gives me the answers to the things I deal with in my life as well as what you deal with. And so it is our example, and the Scriptures certainly are our example. So the Scriptures are an example to us over and over. And the Scriptures are an example of consistency. Consistency. Let's take our Bible and go to the book of Philippians tonight. Philippians chapter 3 and verse number 17. And it's an example of consistency in the person of the Apostle Paul. And so we see many characters. I love to preach on the characters of the Bible. I've preached on the characters in our church for a long time now. But the characters of the Bible, really good stuff because it's, it's real practical and helpful to us in our Christian life. But Paul said in Philippians chapter 3 and verse number 17... He said, uh, brethren, or the believers at Philippi, the church at Philippi, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk so as ye have us for an example. The word imitate, he says followers together, and the word imitate means to imitate Christ. Now, a church is to follow their pastor because he's the chief shepherd. We know that. I'm the under-shepherd. And a church is to follow the under-shepherd as he follows God. 
But there are times, even in a church, sometimes we hear about it today, sometimes a pastor gets into trouble, pastor gets into a problem, morally, whatever the case may be. Always keep your eyes on Christ. And if you keep your eyes on Christ, you'll never be disappointed. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 12, verse number 1, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. The author of our faith means salvation. The finisher of our faith means he's going to keep us and present us faultless one day before the Lord. So unless we are imitators of Jesus Christ, we leave false impressions with others as a Christian as to what Christianity is really all about. And then the Bible also uh, talks about the word mark, and the word mark there, it means to intently observe. Those believers who live according to a godly pattern, you ought to observe their life, and follow their life as they follow God. And, and we don't worship one another, but each other can be a great example and encouragement to one another. And you ought to follow those. The Bible talks much about those who are older in the church, and, and they're, they're saints and, and the definition of a saint is a Christian, a person who's been, been born again by the Spirit of God. So it talks about the saints. It says the older women in the church are to be example to the younger women. And the older men are to be an example to the younger men as a, potter, as a pattern to follow. And when they deal with difficulties in their life, then we ought to be able to go to older Christians who are mature. And they ought to be able to help us, younger people who maybe are not as mature in Christ. So the scriptures are an example. And we have the example of consistency in the person of Paul. Now we also have an example of character, and character is a big thing. You need to have character. I remember many, many years ago in, in the country, uh, many, many years ago with, with the White House, I'm getting political stuff, and that's not what we're talking about tonight, but that is going around that it doesn't matter what you do in your spare time. No, character is all the time. And there's a big discussion our country many years ago about that and some difficulties that were going on. But character means you do what's right when nobody's looking. And you do right when people are looking. But character is very important. Turn to Genesis chapter 6 and verse number 9. Genesis chapter 6 and verse number 9. So very important for a Christian to have good character. Very important for a pastor to have good character and uh, be an example to the flock, be an example to the community, be an example to the church. But we have the example of character in a man by the name of Noah. If it wouldn't be for Noah, we wouldn't be here tonight. Noah, uh, Genesis chapter 6 and verse number 9, the Bible says this. Now, let's look at verse number 8. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man. The word just means he was a righteous man without blemish. And perfect, and that it means sinless. That means he was mature. He was a mature man in his generations. And what's it say? And Noah walked with God. What an example. What an example of consistency. What an example of character in that Noah did exactly what God told him to do. And he built an ark to the specifications exactly of what God told him to do down to the very last minute detail, and God preserved the human race when he sent the flood to destroy the world. And every time you see a rainbow in the sky, in Genesis it talks about he would never again destroy the earth by flood. And so when I see a rainbow, I'm always reminded of the scriptures. And the scripture is our example. It's our example of uh, integrity. It's, in, it's our example of consistency. It's our example of character. In the midst of total corruption, now get this, in the midst of total corruption, Noah walked with God. You know, some people say today, well, Pastor, I'm glad you can do it, but I can't do it. Now, wait a minute. I can do it. You can do it. Because he's given to us all things, given to us all things that pertain to life, and godliness through the person of Jesus Christ. And so we can live uh, the Christian life. We can live a godly life. And then let's go to the book of Joshua tonight. Joshua uh, chapter 14. And so we see that the scriptures are, are an example. And in the scriptures we have an example of consistency in the person of the apostle Paul. And he encouraged them to be followers 
of Christ, followers of him as he is followers of Christ. We have the example of character in the person of Noah. And then we have the example of trust in a man by the name Caleb. It's important that you trust people. But sometimes you can't trust people, can you? But Caleb was a man you could trust. Take, take your Bible to Joshua chapter 14. Joshua chapter 14 tonight. In verse number 6. Joshua chapter or 14 verse 6. When the children of Judah came unto Joshua and Gilgal, and Caleb the son of Jephthah, the Kinzianite, said unto him, Thou knowest the thing that the Lord said unto Moses, the man of God, concerning me and thee in Kadesh Barnea. Forty years old was I when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land. And I brought him word again as it was in mine heart. Now this is the account. What they're talking about is when they sent the, uh, they sent the spies into the land. And many of them came back and said it can't be done. Two of them came back and said it came, could be done. And the two people were Caleb and Joshua. And so Josh is referring back historically with the person of Caleb. And Caleb is saying, 40 years old, in verse 7, was I when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me to Kadesh Barnea to espy out the land. And I brought him word again as it was in mine heart that we could take the land. Nevertheless, my brethren that went up with me made the heart of the people to melt. Let me just stop right there and say, each one of us has a great, influence an example on people and if we're negative people we're critical people that influences people in a critical negative way and so he Caleb said I came back and I told you what was in my heart but nevertheless the brethren went out up with me made the heart of the people to melt but I wholly followed the Lord my God they got the, the people so discouraged. And, and we, we preached through the book of Numbers many years ago, and we talked about all this kind of stuff as we go through the Bible. But we need to be very careful in our life that we don't discourage people. We need to be very careful in our Christian life that we don't live in a way that discourages people. Now, was it the ten, ten spies came back and said, it can't be done. But let's rewind. Who said it could be done? God. God wasn't asking them to come back and bring an evil report. He already had given them the promised land. True? That's true. He'd already get, he just wanted them to go and just see what was in the land. But they got so discouraged, they got so despondent, that when they came back with the evil report, it so discouraged the majority of the people that it caused their heart to melt. And they were so discouraged that they said, we can't do that. There's giants in the land. We can't go up against the giants. But when God's on your side, it doesn't matter what's on the other side. And so they discourage the people. And so what, a, what an example that we need to have, that we need to be careful that we're not discouraging people from the things that God wants us to do. Verse number 9. And Moses swore on that day, saying, Surely the land whereon thy, whereon thy feet hath trodden shall be thine inheritance, and thy children's forever, because thou hast wholly followed the Lord my God. And now, behold, the Lord hath kept me alive, as he said, these forty and five years. It's been forty-five years since the promise of God through Moses that he said, you can have the land. So Caleb's around forty or so. Now he's around, what, eighty-five years of age. And he remembers the promise of God. And he says, The Lord hath kept me alive in verse 10 these forty and five years, even since the Lord spake this word unto Moses, while the children of Israel wandered in the wilderness. And now, lo, I am this day fourscore and five years old, eighty-five years old. As yet I am as strong this day as I was in the day that Moses sent me. Now, let's stop there. As you get older, do you get stronger? <laughs> you get stronger. I remember a person one time said, You know, I don't, I don't need to the Medicare and I don't need the Medicare supplement because I'm in good health and I'm not having any problems and, but you know when you get older you just start having problems but Caleb is 85 a different time period he's 85 years old and he says I'm as strong today as I was 45 years ago and the little chorus I want that mountain really comes out of this that we've sung many times in our church 
And so he says in verse uh, number 12, Now therefore, give me this mountain. Give me this mountain. Whereof the Lord spake in that day, for thou heardest in the day how the Anakins, and those were the giants, were there, and that the cities were great and fenced. If so be, the Lord will be with me. What a, what a qualifying phrase there. If the Lord will be with me, then I shall be able to drive them out, as the Lord said. Verse 13. And Joshua blessed him and gave unto Caleb, the son of Jephthah, Hebron, for an inheritance. What an example that Caleb trusted God. You trust God? My favorite verse in the Bible, Proverbs 3, 5 and, 5 and 6, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not to thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy steps or thy path. He'll lead you and guide you in your life. So we have an example of consistency. We have an example of character. We have an example of trust. And now we have a negative example of corruption of corruption take your bible and go to first samuel chapter 2 first samuel chapter 2 <clears throat> first samuel <coughs> excuse me first samuel chapter 2 so we have an example of corruption and in chapter 2 and verses 22 through 25 this is the the account of eli and eli was the priest and his sons and how his sons were living wicked, ungodly lives. And the Bible says in verse number 22, Now Eli was very old, and he heard all that his sons did unto all Israel, and how they lay with the women. Now let's should be very blunt about that. The Bible says here that he lay with the women that assembled at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. Eli's sons were performing immoral acts outside the tabernacle. What an example. What an example of corruption. What an example of sinfulness and wickedness. And he said unto them, Why do ye do such things? For I hear of your evil dealings by all the people. Nay, my sons, for it is no good report that I hear you make the people Lord's people to transgress if one man sin against another the judge shall judge him but if a man sin against the Lord who shall entreat uh, for him notwithstanding they hearken not unto the voice of their father because the Lord would slay them God's going to kill them we need to be very careful how we live our life we need to be very careful the type of, of example that we are. Eli's shallow rebuke really fell on deaf ears. Same thing really happened to a man by the name of Lot in the book of Genesis 19. But the sons of Eli had no respect for their father. They had no respect for the things of God. And they had no respect for following the ordinance of God, uh, ordinance of God because they were rebellious and wicked, wicked an example, an example of corruption. So the Bible doesn't just get paint all the good pictures. It paints the good and the bad. But every one of us are an example, whether we like it or not. And we're either a good example or a bad example. You can't really be neutral, either good or you're bad. And so the scriptures are examples. And so as we go through the scriptures and we see these different characters and how they were an example, we go to another one in chapter 15 of 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter 15. 1 Samuel chapter 15. And here's an example of disobedience. Don't raise your hand. Have you ever disobeyed God? God ever tell you to do something and you say, I don't think I'm going to do that. We've all been there, haven't we? The example of disobedience, and this is King Saul. He's the first king of Israel. He, the Bible says he stood head and shoulders above every person. And they got a king because Israel wanted a king. And they, they weren't satisfied really with the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And they wanted a king 
so they could be like all the other nations. And God said, I want you to be a different nation so the other nations will look to you and be drawn to God and drawn to the Lord, and yet they wanted to go really into the world and be just like the world and all the nations around them. And so God gave them a king. And we know the story with Samuel, and Samuel was very upset about that. And, and, and God said to Samuel, he says, they have not rejected you. They've rejected me. And so here's King Saul, and he starts out so well in his life. He does well for quite a while, but then he gets to the place that really he doesn't think the, the rules apply to him. Hey, this Bible applies as much to me as it does to you. And there's nobody beyond the rules of God's Word. And when you get beyond the rules of God's Word, you're in for some very difficult times in your life. And he really thought he got, it really didn't apply to him. And so in 1 Samuel chapter 15 and verse number 13, the Bible says this. And Samuel, Samuel's the prophet, Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said unto him, Blessed be thou of the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. <laughs> when I read my Bible sometimes, I just have to start laugh, laughing because he hadn't performed the commandment of the Lord. And as we read on down, we see, And Samuel said, What meaneth then this bleeding of the sheep in mine ears and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? And he was supposed to destroy the king and everything that the king had. That's what God told him to do. And he says, Hey, Samuel, great to see you, man. I just want you to know I've, I've performed the commandment of the Lord. And I like Samuel. He says, well, if you have, then what's that sound I'm hearing over there? <laughs> and Saul said, verse 15, They have brought them from the Amalekites. For the people spared the best of the... Now, let's not pass right over that. For the people. Who's Saul blaming? Who's responsible? Who's the king? Do you think the king has said, hey, no, 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 you can't bring those over here. But what he does, he throws the people under the bus, and he says, for the people brought, the, spared the best of sheep and the oxen to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God. That sounds really pious, doesn't it? That sounds spiritual, doesn't it? <laughs> and to sacrifice the Lord thy God, and the rest we have utterly destroyed. Samuel said unto Saul, stay. And I will tell thee what the Lord hath said to me this night. And he said unto him, Say on. And Samuel said, When thou wast little in thine own sight, wast thou not made the head of the tribes of Israel? And the king anointed thee king over Israel. And the Lord sent thee on a journey and said, Go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they be consumed. Wherefore then didst thou not obey the voice of the Lord, but didst fly upon the spoil, and didst evil in the sight of the Lord? Saul said unto Samuel, Yea, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. Really? And have gone the way which the Lord sent me, and have brought Agag, the king of the Amalekites, and have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. But the people took of the spoil sheep and oxen and sheep of the things which should have been utterly destroyed to sacrifice the Lord thy God in Gilgal. And Samuel said, Hath the Lord, this is a great, this is one of the great verses of the Bible. Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. And to hearken than the fat of rams. For rebellion, and that's what we're talking about, folks. Whenever you or I disobey the voice of God or the word of God, we are rebelling against God. For rebellion is as a sin of witchcraft and stubbornness as an iniquity and idolatry because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord. He hath also rejected thee 
from being king. I think sometimes in our Christian life, we don't see the seriousness of things that we get involved in. And I don't think a lot of times, even as individuals, that we think it's a big deal to disobey. But it's a great big deal. Children, when parents ask kids to do something and they don't do it immediately, they disobey. They become disobedient. And problems begin to fester and grow. But I think sometimes in the Christian life, this is my observation. The Bible says, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. Galatians chapter 6, verse 9 talks about that. But I think sometimes in the Christian life, we get away from God and we get off track and we start disobeying God in little areas or whatever. And, we move away. and, and sometimes I don't think people really think it's that big of a deal until down here, they're way away from God. And they're way away from God. But they didn't see the consequence of their sin when they first disobeyed God. I don't think Saul saw the consequence when he disobeyed God. Not immediately. But when Samuel said, man, since you disobeyed God, God has rejected you from being king. And God was going to take his kingdom and give it to David. And Saul would die a death of a suicide and disgrace and everything else. And he seeks out the witch at Endor and he's into all kinds of stuff. And, and, and you think, how could you get that far? You ever wonder sometimes as a Christian, whatever happened to somebody who's faithful in our church and we're here all the time, what happened to them? Little steps at a time. Little steps of disobedience. I'm not going to obey God here. I'm not going to obey God here. I'm not going to obey God here. I hear what, what the preacher says. I hear what the Bible says, but I don't really agree with that. I don't want to do that. I'm not going to do that. And before long, they move farther and farther and farther away from God. And like Saul, he lost everything. As a pastor, I never desire to see people in our church get away from God. I never say, I told you so. I don't say that because I'm incapable of getting away from God as much as any of us in here are. But when you disobey God and that example of disobedience, it begins to multiply itself and causes many, many difficulties in your life. When the Spirit of God is speaking to you in a service or you're reading your Bible and the Holy Spirit of God is speaking to you about doing something that you need to do, please do it. Please obey God. Please follow whatever God's instructions are because we have the example of Scripture for the good and for the bad. And let's go back to Joshua chapter 7 here tonight. Joshua chapter 7. Joshua chapter 7, verse number 20. Now we have an example of greed. You know what they say that drives the stock market? <laughs> no. Fear and greed. When people are afraid, many times they sell. And long time, first told me a long time ago, you, you really haven't taken a loss. You, well, I look at my statements down a lot of down a lot of money right now. But it's a paper loss. You say, what? It's only a loss when you pull it out. And you pull it out because of fear. And if you'll hang on, even when the World Trade Centers were demolished, the stock market went down 30%. But if you stayed in that thing after a while, it came all the way back and went beyond that. But people in that fear... And greed. It's going up and up and up and up. So you just more and more and more. And people are borrowing off everything. They're borrowing off their house and borrowing off. <laughs> speculating all kinds. That's just a principle and illustration. But those are the two things that drive the stock market. And these, this is an example of greed 
in a person's life, and his name was Achan. And he's found in Joshua chapter 7, verse 20 and 21. And if you know some of the story here, and they go up to battle, and they defeat the enemy, then they have a problem in a little town by the name of Ai. It's the letter A and the letter I. That's Ai. It's a little town. So Joshua sends up a token army to take care of those little, it's a little group of people. And they get killed. And they come back, and people lost their lives. And Joshua's in a panic. He said, what in the world's happened? And he didn't seek the Lord. And he didn't do what God wanted him to do. And God, in essence, as you read the account, and Joshua's praying to the Lord. And, everything, and in essence, God's saying this, and I may paraphrase this a little bit. He's saying, get up off your knees. You don't need to pray. The problem is there is sin in the camp of Israel. And because there's sin in the camp of Israel, you suffered a humiliating loss, and people lost their lives at a little place called Ai. And until you get that right, you're not going to go forward. And so Joshua begins to call all the people out and one by one and so on, and they have to come before Joshua and those type of things. But in Joshua chapter 7, verse 20 and 21, it finally gets to a person by the name of Achan. And the Bible says, And Achan answered Joshua and said, Indeed, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel, and thus and thus have I done. When I saw among the spoils a goodly Babylonish garment and 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold of 50 shekels weight, then I coveted them. And took them, and behold, they are hid in the earth in the midst of my tent, and the silver underneath it. And he coveted these things. Achan was really tired and dissatisfied with the way God had ordered the affairs of his life. I preached that message some time ago. Is it, is it really worth it? Is it worth it? follow the Lord. Well, I believe it's worth it, but Job got to that place. I, I don't know if it's really worth it. And so Achan, really, he's not satisfied with the way his life is, and so he steals something that he has no business taking, and because of his sin, it cost the lives of men. There were families who didn't have a father that night. There were wives who didn't have a husband that night because of his example of greed. I preach a whole message. There's a whole lot in the Bible about greed. I'm going to preach that tonight. But be careful in your Christian life with greed. There's nothing wrong with having money. There's nothing wrong with having possessions. There's nothing wrong with having things. Having money is a good thing. The Bible says it's the love of money that gets us in trouble. But having money makes life a whole lot easier. <laughs> But when you love it more than anything else and you begin to covet it and greed sets in, then that becomes a real problem in your life. And so God allows, God, or rather God always gets to the guilty party in verses 13 and 14. Tribes, families, households, man by man, Numbers 32, 23. The Bible says, and be sure your sin will find you out. We use that verse for many things. It's really talking about one of the tribes of Israel not going over and battling, and we can make application for other things. But he was saying, if you don't participate in this, one of the tribes of Israel, be sure your sin in not doing that is going to find you out. And we've used that verse many years for different applications, and that's fine. And then the last thing tonight we'll stop is an example of the consequences of sin. An example of the consequences of sin. Tur turn to Jude, next to the last book in the Bible. It has one chapter. And in Jude, verse chapter 1 and verse 7, we have the example of the consequences of sin in a place called Sodom and Gomorrah. And Sodom and Gomorrah are actually two cities, the city of Sodom and the city of Gomorrah. The Bible says in verse 7, even as Sodom and Gomorrah 
and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. And God judged them. And the consequence of their sin was fire and brimstone. Over the course of many years, some people say, well, you're, you're kind of a fire and brimstone preacher. I just want to be true to the Bible. If the Bible says it, that's fine. I, you know, the connotation, you get different pictures in your mind what that even means or what. But the consequences of their sin was fire and brimstone and total destruction. God sent some angels down to Lot's house. And it's amazing. He tells them the judgment of God and, and of course, homosexuality and all that was going on in Sodom and Gomorrah and those type of things. And, and the men of the city were pressing on the doors of his house and they wanted to know the men, the angels. They didn't know the angels, but the men who came in. And one of the most tragic things in the Bible is Lot says, Here, I have some virgin daughters. You can have them. How do you get there? How do you get there? I believe Lot was a saved man because the Bible says in the New Testament, it vexed his righteous soul. But he was backslidden big time. And they didn't want his daughters. They wanted the men. What would get a guy or a father to that point? The Bible says his, his son-in-laws laughed at him because he had no example. The angels had to drag him out of the city. We know the story of Lot's wife, and she turned back, turned to a pillar of salt. And after that, Lot and his daughters, and there's all kinds of wickedness going on. The consequences of sin. So church tonight, as I stop here at this part of the message, this right here is our example for faith and practice in every area of our life. Please be the example God wants you to be. Saul started out good, but boy, he ended up a mess. And so Paul said, Let no man despise thy youth, Timothy, but be thou an example of the word. And we could define, define those words. We've done that before purity and all those things about being the example in all aspects of your life as a young preacher Timothy don't be upset don't let older Christians or older people despise the fact that you're young let no man despise thy youth but be thou an example church let's always strive to be the example that God wants us to be and all God's people said our Heavenly Father, thank you for the truths of the Word of God tonight. Thank you for these, our people who have come tonight. Pray, Lord, that the message has been a help and encouragement to each person that's here, maybe those who are watching online tonight. God, it's so important that we be the right kind of example in every area of our life. And yet sometimes, Lord, it's hard to be an example. It's hard to stand up and have the character, the example of character that we need to have. But it's so, so very important. Lord, I pray you'd meet with us this coming Sunday as we begin our missions conference. Lord, I pray it'd be a wonderful uh, meeting here Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday as Brother Freeman from China comes and preaches the Word of God and have another young missionary couple from Sri Lanka and then the mocks that are here from do the children's homes around the world. And Lord, be, missions conferences are wonderful things in our church. And I pray, God, that people would come, they would be here, be faithful to hear the Word of God. But, Lord, help us in our daily life to be the example that you want us to be in all areas of our life, that we would truly be pleasing to you. Thank you for our time to be together tonight. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you for being here tonight.